Oh my guys, it is an absolutely, I mean spectacularly gorgeous, over the top beautiful. It is a Saturday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. It is Christmas Eve. It is Christmas Eve in Grass Valley, California. And looking at pictures of Buffalo, New York. And glad I'm not in upstate New York on this glorious Christmas Eve. 2022 and I was thinking I was going to spare you guys today and tomorrow uh, but anyway a doomers work is never done and I am very sorry I don't remember who the kind listener was who sent me this link to this excellent story out of an outfit called Do the Math. Do the Math from UCSD. Would that be San Diego, University of California, San Diego? Is there one? Anyway, if this is uh, by a fellow named Tom Murphy. I have no clue who uh, Tom Murphy is. Okay, here we go. About Tom Murphy. So. Who is this dude? Tom Murphy is a professor of physics at the University of California in San Diego, an amateur astronomer and high school physics major at Georgia Tech. All right. PhD physics at Caltech. Um, anyway, sounds like a good guy. Uh, sounds like a man we can trust to do the math and what Tom is doing the math on today is the simple story, the simple story of civilization. And this is an excellent essay. It is a very long essay. I don't have time to sit here and read the whole thing, but we're just going to read the middle of it. We're going to dive into the middle of it. Uh, and if you, I'm going to put the link on here. I highly advise you to go on and read this whole essay, particularly if you're one of our new 1,464 new subscribers. Welcome aboard. If you're trying to figure this out, what us crazy doomers have been talking about, uh, listen to Tom Doomer Tom Murphy. Take it away, Tom. <clears throat> In order to make comprehensible the vast tract of human time on this planet, itself 5,000 times shorter than the age of the universe, I will compare the two and a half to three million year presence of humans defined as the genus Homo on Earth in a 75 year human lifespan a span that we can grasp intuitively. On this scale, we get the following analogous periods. Okay, for the first 70 years, various species of humans evolve and coexist on the planet. All right, that brings us up to age 70. The last five years, the age of Homo sapiens, about 200,000 years of mostly sustainable existence, you know, for most of that 200, that last five years. Okay, 15 weeks ago, the last 15 weeks, we have been in the age of civilization, which he calls agriculture, then cities, roughly starting about 10,000 years ago. Okay, let's come up to the last four days, the age of science. Now we're going to bring it up to the last 36 hours, the age of fossil fuels, and the last 12 hours. So you would be 74 years, 364 days, and 12 hours old. At this point, the last 12 hours of your life, the age of rapid global 
ecological devastation, which Tom says that effectively 50 years ago, you know, the 1970 benchmark, and I'm with Tom on this. It was 1970 that we went over the cliff and there's no coming back. Uh, I will say we entered the full age of human extinction 50 years ago. I'm 63, that sounds about right. <clears throat> All right. On this lifetime scale, agriculture is a recent unexpected hobby we picked up and one that is still pretty much new to us in the scheme of things. Or maybe we can compare it, meaning agriculture, to a gateway drug that radically changed our behavior, our values, attitudes, and expectations. It gave us the munchies. Or maybe agriculture is like the rapid onset of a mental disorder. In any case, our friends and relatives would be pretty alarmed by the unchar this uncharacteristic change toward the end of a long life. In the last four days, we took our hobby to a whole new level. Agriculture is about control of at least part of nature. <coughs> science, the age of science, put that control on steroids. Maybe it's like cocaine following the gateway drug. It gave us, the age of science, gave us a mechanism by which to learn from controlled experiments and then exercise imperfect, problematic control over an expanding set of domains. It amped things up. In the last day or so, we found an even more potent enabler. Let's see, I've already used steroids for the previous step, so what would steroids on steroids be? Fossil fuels equipped us with superpowers to carry out scientifically guided ambitions to previously unimaginable new levels. I seem to recall from the scare films in my youth that drugs like PCP can make us think we have superpowers so we're prone to jump out of a window convinced we can fly. Similarly, the superpowers granted by this short-lived, finite resource have tricked us into thinking that the superpowers are an intrinsic human quality. <clears throat> Owing to our big brains, not to the substance, beguiled by this false flattery, we tell ourselves that nothing can stop our boundless juggernaut of innovation. In this altered state, you know, on PCP, we find ourselves on a destructive rampage as evidenced by the severe toll on habitats and biodiversity about 85% of primary forest is gone. Vertebrate populations have declined by about 70% on average since 1970. And now 96% of mammal mass on the planet is embodied in humans and our livestock. We hear this uh, figure over and over. Uh, the dots are not difficult to connect. I invite anyone to go uh, read the comments section on my uh, interview. <laughs> it's soft white uh, underbelly. The dots are not difficult to connect. The combination of methods and substances available to us have allowed explosive exploitation of resources on a global scale. 
a paltry and decreasing amount of habitat increasingly fragmented remains. The healthy biodiverse regions are disappearing fast. And I'm just going to break in with Tom uh, and talk about this is why I'm saying the absolute worst catastrophe on this planet is if humans really do get hold of a limitless supply of truly green energy. Uh, it would leave fossil fuels in the dust. Okay, fossil fuels is the inefficiency of the efficient fossil fuels is the only reason we have one acre of biodiverse habitat left on this planet. If nuclear fusion were to replace fossil fuels, this planet will be doomed a lot quicker than fossil fuels. But anyway, just had to stick that in because some people do not understand why I am not an environmentalist. Anyway, back to Tom. So, reflect on how you would react to a 75-year-old relative who went on a euphoric bender as extreme and damaging as the one in this story. It's as if this otherwise stable and mostly harmless person spiraled into manic behavior so quickly as to leave us stunned. It's as jarring as a crash, like slamming into a brick wall. We might even suspect an alien baby gestating in our relative's stomach cavity. So outlandish is their behavior. For the safety of your relative and all those around them, you would probably want them sedated and strapped to a bed in a hospital for observation. Ironically, our recent hobby obsession with control has left us spiraling out of control. The backdrop or fabric of your existence the few hours for which you have been alive on our scale seems entirely normal to you. But the whole point of this post is that it's really just not. It is just not normal. This condition, <coughs> the condition of, uh, of humanity, this condition seems unlikely to be solved by technology. Hmm, wouldn't we say that technology is a primary ingredient of the illness? Cleverness, cleverness and an illusion of control got us here, and they are not our best tools for extracting ourselves from this mess. Of course, go on the comments on Soft White Underbelly and listen to the techno-utopians. <clears throat> I have written other pieces about the foundational flaws in our growth trajectory on a finite planet, about the idiotically narrow construct of money and how decisions based on money will be bad decisions. If it makes economic sense, it almost certainly batters the ecosystem. I have posted about the cognitive distortion produced by fossil fuels and the tragic fallacy of building an enormous human population on the back of a finite resource that threatens a devastating population crash when its availability inevitably declines. The real ultimate value is in biodiversity and ecosystem health, which suggests de-emphasizing the primacy of humans 
and becoming subordinate partners on the planet rather than its self-appointed and ultimately inept overlords presiding over the demise of our transitory empire. I like this guy. I'm liking this guy better with every, sen with every sentence. He is saying exactly what I said in a little bit more colorful language on my interview on Soft White Underbelly. So take it from a PhD in what astrophysics or whatever, if you, don't, if you don't want to listen to this old hippie. All right. But stepping back and using our temporal framework as a mental guide, we are justified in asking whether our path of civilization is wrong at its very roots. That might seem extreme, but we are indeed at an extreme nexus in the history of our planet. I did not start out thinking this way, as the long evolution of this blog series attests. I mean, I knew our growth path could not last and that fossil fuel substitution would be harder than many appreciated, but I never entertained the idea that civilization itself was a bad idea. It is not eagerly that I tread these waters, so he's talking about his evolution from being a clueless moron to an apocaloptimist to a full-fledged doomer which is the evolution of most people down in the doomosphere. It's not like you, you, you go directly from clueless moron to doomer. When they, they, you know, it's, it, it is an evolution. This is exactly what I went through, and my guess is anybody down in this rabbit hole, unless you ate 10 grams of mushrooms instead of 5. Okay. <clears throat> The surprisingly recent gateway experiment of agriculture led, in a causally connected way, to surplus storage, permanent settlements, accumulation of material possessions, hierarchy, standing armies, property rights, the laughable concept that we own the land, patriarchy and monotheism, subjugation of humans and animals, soil degradation, habitat destruction, extinction rates far above normal, and all the rest. A bad trip, all for the sake of controlled food production and storage the lack of which did not prevent humans from living sustainably for millions of years. Likewise, wild animals in healthy ecosystems do not appear to live in constant misery. They've got it figured out in a way that works and is stable. We don't look at a bird chirping and flitting through the trees and react in horror at the pitiful state it must find itself in, lacking the means to control its environment? Why should we look at pre-agricultural humans and imagine horrific misery as many are inclined to do? Since our civilization is not built on a foundation of sustainable principles, it is no surprise that we find it now to be utterly unsustainable. Unsustainable means certain failure, by the way. That is a perfectly good definition of unsustainable, certain failure. Thus, our civilization was custom built for failure. Congratulations! The unfolding story just transpires over enough 
lifespans that it all seems gradual to us as individuals and therefore does not feel pressing or inevitable based on our narrow, direct experience. In hindsight, I suspect it will be forehead slapping obvious to the point of making us look rather dull-witted. I like flight analogies here. A rock is not designed on the aerodynamic principles of sustainable, in this case indefinite, level flight. A rock can nonetheless become airborne, follow a graceful and exhilarating arc through the air, but then certainly plummet back to earth. Likewise, our civilization, also not founded on principles of sustainability, can soar upward for a time during our inheritance spending spree and seem like great fun to us, giving it paying passengers tremendous satisfaction for a time presently waiting for us is Earth and planetary limits. An important aside is that this condition is not intrinsic to the human animal. Most of our life on this planet has not been characterized by a smash-and-grab rampage. That is our new trick for the last 15 weeks, recently perfected and now at fever pitch. Dazzling! We can learn other tricks, take up new hobbies that don't wreck our lives and those of our loved ones, such as other species. Slow, thoughtful hobbies rather than this frenetic one. Oh. This guy, this guy is good. All right. As so many of the clueless morons uh, trashing me in the comments uh, for the past few weeks, you might be thinking, well, okay, maybe we have overshot a bit and need to dial things back, but surely... We can hold on to something we would recognize as civilization. I mean, come on! Well, truthfully, I don't know if it is possible to preserve civilization, and neither does anyone else. To state the obvious, wanting civilization to continue is not enough without biophysical backing. I suspect that for most people who assume a continuation and even expansion into space, their examination is paper thin, not based on a careful consideration of biophysical limits, but more a matter of uncritical and fantastical extrapolation based on an admittedly head-spinning recent binge. I mean, history. My reasonable doubt is semi-quantitative. We have consumed a sizable fraction of our non-renewable inheritance, mineral concentrations, fossil fuels, etc., on the time scale of a century, even a tenth of the current scale, one-tenth of our current scale, itself a terrifying prospect to many, we might slow the drawdown to give us another 1,000 years or so, another few weeks in our lifespan analogy, aggressive recycling and more resources than I credit 
might stretch things for 10,000 years, translating to a few months. Keep in mind, this is already in the context of sustainability and deliberately dialed down human footprint lacking any precedent. Note that 10,000 years is still very short in the scheme of things and signals that we may well be nearer the end of civilization than the beginning. The doctor is saying we have at best a few weeks or months to live unless we make a radical change in our lifestyle and practices. At this rate, it is more likely mere days if we heed the advice and make a major course correction. Be prepared for the detox experience to be unpleasant but necessary. I am not interested in fantastical or magical thinking. The suggestion against mounting evidence to the contrary that we could or should maintain this architecture for this ecologically devastating mode of living for any significant duration strikes me as simply wishful and also heartbreaking. I would like to get beyond that and be hard-nosed about what can really happen subject to planetary limits, most importantly, preserving habitat and biodiversity. So anyway, guys, I'm going to stop there. I am about halfway through this. Uh, and if you want to take it over from here, I like where he laughs off this uh, notion of uh, the transition to renewable energy ain't going to happen. And if it does happen, we will be in worse shape than before the transition. Uh, let's see. So he wrapped up the original essay, Make Biodiversity and Ecological Health the Highest Priority and work within the resulting constraints. All decisions should start with the question, would this action help or harm the larger and ultimately more important non-human world? So he originally, but then he uh, had to add a rather long postscript I guess he read that book by uh, Robert Jensen, An Inconvenient Apocalypse. You know, I, I interviewed Robert Jensen the day that book, An Inconvenient Apocalypse, came out. Uh, you can find my interview with Dr. Jensen uh, somewhere here on Collapse Chronicles. And you can download his book for free. It's just 70 pages. So his final comment of his P.S. To echo a provocative sentiment others have used to great effect, what good is a Honduran white bat, you ask? Well, what good are you? How have humans, or you personally, in balance or in net terms helped this planet's wild species or overall ecosystem health? Are you more valuable or less valuable to sustaining biodiversity than the Honduran white bat? The newt 
or even the mosquito. Yeah, that hard truth stings me too. Now it should be the new Me Too movement. Am I any more important in the scheme of things than a mosquito? A mosquito has every bit as much right to be on this planet as I do or you do. But anyway, I've already forgot this man's name. I think it was Tom Murphy, and I will, uh, I'm going to have to go back and check more of Tom Murphy's essays, but I'll put the link on here, and that'll link you over to his blog where you can find a lot more of this. Anyway, don't know if I will have a Christmas rant, so if not, I uh, have a merry little uh, planet-saving Christmas. Uh, here's a 99-cent can of Arizona iced tea to toast the human race. Toast the human race, I wish. Bye, guys.